Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, I actually flew back from London to be here today. So, um, you know, I hope that you don't mind that I'm just a little bit jet lagged. Um, now, um, I have spent the last half a dozen years immersed in the study of Rapunzel. I first read Rapunzel when I was a little girl. Um, I, I'd been a very sick child and I was in hospital. Um, my left tear duct was um, destroyed by a dog attack when I was only two years old. And um, unable to control my tears, I was in and out of hospital um, with life-threatening infections. Um, I've always got a very strong connection to Rapunzel. Um, we were both girls locked away from the world against our will. Um, we were both lonely, we were both afraid. Um, my tears made me desperately ill and half blind. Rapunzel's tears healed her lover's blindness and made him well. So the story of Rapunzel gave me hope. It, it made me believe that perhaps one day I too could escape and I too one day could be healed. As I grew up, um, I used to uh, wonder about the story. Why did the witch lock Rapunzel in a tower? Why did she have to climb up Rapunzel's hair? Why didn't the prince just bring Rapunzel a rope? <laughs> <laughs> troubled by these kind of holes in the story, by these gaps and tatters. And so I began to spin my own cloth of fancy to answer these type of questions. That cloth of fancy became my novel, Bit of Greens, and also led me to doing um, my doctorate on Rapunzel. And I had to write an exegesis called The Rescue of Rapunzel. Um, when I began working on on Rapunzel, I thought I was alone in my fascination, in my obsession. But what I came to realise is that there were actually many other reimaginings of the tale. Strangely enough, many of them from Australian creative artists. Um, I became fascinated. I, I began to wonder what is it about Rapunzel that so resonates with the Australian creative imagination. Um, I have found nine different Australian retellings of Rapunzel, including my own. Nine is a very potent fairy tale number. And so I'm going to explore a few of those other retellings for you today. However, before I go on, I thought it might be, it might be illuminating for me to elucidate Rapunzel for you. Fairy tales have their roots in ancient old tales. Tales of gods and goddesses, epic cycles of life, death, and rebirth. The German feminist scholar Heidi gottner Avendroth, and I please forgive me for not pronouncing her name very well, my German is appalling. Uh, Heidi gottner Avendroth, she has convincingly argued that fairy tales primarily told by female tellers to female audiences contain remnants of lost matriarchal myths. Over time, the potency and purity of these mythic symbols have been drained of meaning and power, partly due to the intervention of patriarchal socio-political systems. The mother goddess became simply a mother, then a stepmother, and then a witch. Her maiden aspect became a princess or a much-hated stepdaughter. The sacred king became a prince or even a tinker or a tailor. The epic cycle of initiation, sacred marriage, descent into the underworld and return became simplified and drained of its sacred meaning. The storyline of Rapunzel clearly carries these type of mythic remnants. We have a struggle between a maiden and a crone. We have a, a marriage with the prince. We have the maiden being cast out and wandering in the wilderness. And then we have her subsequent transformation into a mother. And then of course we have the prince's wounding and healing, his descent into darkness and return into the light. For a long time, these mythic remnants were lost as the tale was recast as one of patriarchal subjugation of the maiden. From Greek mythology onwards, most maiden in the tower tales saw the girl 
been locked away from the world by her father. One of the earliest um, men in the tower tales is this one, uh, the story of Danai and the Golden Shower, which was um, extremely popular. It was actually retold by you know, Sophocles, by Aristotle, by many of the um, ancient Greek dramatists. It also appears in Jewish and Islamic and in the French troubadour tradition. This particular tale, um, the story of um, Zal and Mirabaya, comes from um, the Islamic narrative tradition. Um, it was told in the 10th century by the poet Fadasi. And in, in this picture, you can't really tell, I'll use my pointer, that that is her loading her hair down to her lover so that he can climb up the hair into the harem. This is the first appearance of the hair ladder in narrative history. And as you can um, see, her hair was black. The first story that actually really closely resembles the Rapunzel tale that we know was told by Jean Battista Basile, an Italian who was actually a Neapolitan uh, courtier. Um, it was, he wrote it around the 1600s and it was published in 1634. Um, it contains six of the seven key motifs that we are recognised as being the story of Rapunzel. There's the theft of parsley or some kind of forbidden food. There's uh, the dark feminine figure, in this case an ogress. There's the tower, the hair ladder, the seduced maiden, the prince. <laughs> But the story ends differently. Um, the, the girl actually uh, escapes with the prince um, and she takes with her um, three magical acorns that belong to the, um, the ogress. As she pour, um, throws them over her shoulder, they transform into beasts which then devour the ogress. And so at the end of the story, the crone figure is killed. Um, the next key retelling of the Rapunzel story was by Charlotte Rose de Camon de la Force, who is actually the heroine of my story, Peter Greens, and so is of particular interest to me. She wrote her story, which was called Personette, in 1697, when she'd been locked away in a convent for her uh, wild and wicked ways, which included, this is my favourite story about Charlotte Rose de la Force, included dressing up in a bear skin and masquerading as a dancing bear so that she could rescue her much younger lover after he'd been locked away in a castle by his parents. Just love that story. Mm -hmm. I like to think the sort of thing that I would have done. <laughs> um, in in Personette, we see the complete memeplex, the complete sequence of motifs that we recognise as a puzzle. There's a theft of parsley, there's a dark feminine figure, in this case a fairy. There's a tower, the hair ladder, the maiden who is seduced by the prince. Uh, the girl person there is then cast out into the wilderness where she gives birth to twins, one boy and a girl. The prince climbs up the hair and then finds there the witch, the fairy, and then he's cast down from the tower height. He falls amongst thorns and he is blinded. And he wanders in the wilderness, desperate, in darkness. And Personette finds him and she weeps and her tears fall upon his eyes and heal his blindness. And then finally, we have at the end of the tale, the, re the, the, the redemption of the witch, where she's moved to, to pity and remorse by the plight of the young lovers. And she helps save them from the wilderness. Now, um, most people think of Rapunzel as being a Grimm Brothers story, and it was certainly included in their first 1812, a collection of fairy tales. However, um, in, that, in that first collection, it was very similar to Charlotte Rose, Dead of Force's story, except that the witch is dropped from the end. There's no redemption, and we do not know whatever happens to her. She simply disappears from the story. Um, the Grimm Brothers were highly criticised for including a story about an unwed teenage mother in their collection. And so over the next 40 odd years, 
they rewrote Rapunzel, um, including the prince and the maiden being married in the tower and um, the disappearance of the twins and the pregnancy. Um, now, why is it that Rapunzel has survived for so many thousands of years when other stories have been lost, abandoned, not retold? Um, Walter Burkert, who's a celebrated German scholar of myth and religion, he's written, a tale becomes traditional not by virtue of being created, but by being retold. A tale is created as a necessary sequence of motor things and has a pragmatic function of telling, of solving a problem. Now, he goes on to say that um, for a story to survive, it must be retold. For a story to be retold, it must articulate some kind of desire or dilemma in both the teller of the tale and, and the audience. And so, we can therefore think what, what desire, what dilemma does Rapunzel articulate for creative artists like myself and like other Australian writers? It's an amazing, um, this is an art installation by Alice um, Anderson, an American artist who was absolutely obsessed with Rapunzel and did amazing work on her. Okay. So I'm going to move now just to telling you a little bit about some of the Australian retellings of Rapunzel. The first was by the poet Dorothy Hewitt. Um, she wrote a remarkable collection of poetry in the 1970s called Rapunzel in Suburbia. And one of the poems, Grey Fairy Tale, is a retelling of Rapunzel. The, uh, it's quite a powerful and very dark and sexual poem. The witch is described as being there when I woke, blocking the light, humming, trying on my clothes. I grew accustomed to her. She was as much a part of me as my own self. When the prince climbs Rapunzel's hair, his foraging hands tore me from neck to heels. The witch jumped up my back and beat me to the wall. Crouched in a corner, I perceived it all. The thighs jackknifed apart, the dangling sword thrust home, pinned like a specimen to scream with joy. The union of the witch and the prince is described in animalistic term. They are hunchbacked and hairy arsed. And as she ran poor, four pawed across the light, the female dropped coined blood spots on the floor. Rapunzel ends up cutting her own hair so that, that the prince should fall. He claws through space as he falls, and then Rapunzel is left bald as our collaborator. And the witch, sometimes I idly kick a little heap of rags across the floor. I notice it grows smaller every year. Dorothy Hewitt's poem, Grey Fairy Tale, came out four years after Anne Sexton's highly influential book of poems, Transformations, which retold many of the grim fairy tales in, po in poetic form. Um, I, I think it's clear that uh, Dorothy Hewitt was influ in influenced by Sexton, but the two poems are very different. In Sexton's poem, um, it's, a, it's famous a love story, a lesbian love story, in which the older woman is left betrayed and abandoned. In Dorothy Hewitt's poem, the witch is a trickster part of the self, a rapacious and, ra and voracious force which uses the girl's youth to, to trap the prince into her sexual toils. Karen Goldsworthy, um, a wonderful Australian writer, um, she grappled with the story uh, in uh, I'm sorry, with a fairy tale in a short story entitled Rapunzel, Rapunzel, published in Mianjin in 1984. Um, it's divided into three parts, told from the point of view of the sorceress, the prince, and Rapunzel. Rapunzel is, is um, described as beauty, growth, and new life. The sorceress's magic is the delicate compounds of herbs and words my customers would gain 
their heart's desire. The sorceress cuts the braid and casts Rapunzel out into a wild, sad place, and the girl is left nothing but a spoilt, wet, and stubbly thing. The end of the sorceress lives as I have always lived, before she was born, beyond good and evil, beyond love. In the final section, which is told from Rapunzel's point of view, the girl reveals that she betrayed herself to the sorceress on purpose. This is a quotation from the story. You will see this moment is the centre of my life, like the world at the heart of a marble, around which everything spins when you flick your thumb. Because I wanted something to happen, I flicked my thumb and sent the marble of my future spinning off out of the circle, away from the game. I really love that quotation. I love this story by Karen Goldsworthy. And to me, this story really seems to link back to those ancient mythologies embedded in the heart of the story. Rapunzel is a force for growth and change. The sorceress as a figure of dark femininity that must be overcome. The next story I want to talk about is by the uh, West Australian writer, Juliet Maria. She published a story in 2005 entitled Let Down Your Hair. It begins, the price of my future was a bunch of lettuce. The girl is not taken by the witch for sheer wickedness. She needed me to do a job. The witch's task was to watch a pot, this is a quote, an iron cauldron hanging from a three-legged stand. As she stirred her bubbling brew, the witch muttered stories. In this brew, the girl sees crowns and swords, goblets and gauntlets, nooses and necklaces. The witch tells her that stirring this pot is the most important job in the world. Let the fire die down, let the soup cool and congeal and something irreplaceable is lost. This witch's pot of stories is linked, therefore, to what Tolkien called the cauldron of story, which has always been boiling, and to it have continually been added new bits, dainty and undainty. In Juliet Marie's story, a woodcutter comes by, but he's seduced away by the witch, and the girl is left alone to stir the pot, Time passes and the girl grows older, she gets wrinkles, she turns grey, and she's alone. But finally the woodcutter comes back and he too is older, he too. He's crooked where he was once straight, he's grey where he was once dark-haired. And they cannot be together, for he's not strong enough to scale the tower. It is only when the cauldron shows the imprisoned woman, now old, a key, and she plunges her hand into the boiling water and seizes the key that she can unlock herself and let the old man in. She cannot leave the tower though, for her task of stirring the pot of stories is too important. And so she and the woodcutter um, stay there in the tower together and simply leave the door unlocked. Marillia's story celebrates the coming of age and of wisdom and it celebrates the importance of storytellers keeping the old tales alive. It's a really beautiful story, and I hope that you, that you look it out and read it. It's in her, her collection called Fickle Moon. Now, in 2009, there were three very different Rapunzel retellings published in Australia by Australian creative artists, and there were... I wonder what it was about 2009 that cause this to happen. The first one is by Deborah Klein, who is um, a visual artist, a best known for her, her paintings and her work. And I've got up there some of her extraordinary works that she has. Her story is only one page long and is accompanied in the book by her mysterious and beautiful paintings. It tells the story in an old-fashioned, traditional style. It begins, there was once a girl who lived all of her life in a tall tower in the midst of a dark and impenetrable wood. The story of Deborah Klein's story has been locked up by her father for a reason that no one can remember. A handsome prince on a milk-white steed 
wide spidey look and the girl entices him by throwing out her hair for him. The prince boasts to her how brave he is, how noble, how many deeds of daring do he has done. And the girl begs him to take her with him. But he refuses because she couldn't do anything with all that hair and her hair is too beautiful for it to be cut off. When the prince wakes in the morning, the girl has cut off her hair and is riding away on his milk-white steed. She jerks the braid so that he is locked in the tower and the prince says, but what am I to do? How am I to escape? Grow your own hair. <laughs> the girl responds and rides off into the sunset. <laughs> It's a, it's a really clever reframing of the story and I mean even though it, it, it reduces the mean plex down of Rapunzel down to only the four best known ones, the witch, the tower, the girl and the prince, it very cleverly recasts the story as a, a comment on men and patriarchal domination of women. Margot Lanigan also published a Rapunzel story in 2009. It's called The Golden Shroud and it's told from the point of view of the prince. The maiden's hair is the most striking image in this story. It's described as motionless fire, a weighty plaited sun, rippling cloth of gold, a sunlit spillage, and most tellingly as a cruelty to her. When the prince is imprisoned by the witch, who's described as being white-faced above her black dress, her hand like a knot of bones. A lock of the maiden's hair rescues him. The lock comes to life, is animated, and it becomes like a snake, and it rears up its head above its coils, and it races through the castle and in through the locks and unlocks the keyhole and lets the prince out. Uh, with the help of the lock of hair, the prince then rescues the maiden and defeats the witch. And the st a storm of golden hair wraps the horror, the witch, in a golden shroud. It's an extraordinary story, intense and poetic like Margot's work always is. Um, and I find it interesting because of the emphasis on the hair. Hair has always been a symbol of life, strength, and regeneration, but in this tale it becomes an instrument of death and revenge. The final this anthology of short stories called Trolls I Do, it again it's very, very different. It's a very comic story. It's called An Unwelcome Guest, and Rapunzel is a deeply unpleasant teenage girl. The witch is a long suffering hostess who wants to get rid of her unwelcome guest so she can go back to making frog jelly. It isn't until she cuts the braid and releases her from the spell of a bad old one that Rapunzel can go back to being a normal kid. In describing his inspiration for this tale, Garth Nix has said that he's always been interested in dark woods, fleeting shadows and misunderstood eccentrics whom the world has labelled evil without attempting to understand their motives. Anxious Letter, another um, extraordinary writer of short stories um, in Australia, um, and, and one whose work is deeply enriched by myth and fairy tale. Her story, Little Radish, was published in 2010. Her heroine just longs for the solitude and silence of a tower. This is a quotation. I imagined an inco incomparable stillness held in by granite, a barrier that nothing could penetrate. In her search to find this, this ivory tower of solitude where she can be alone, a uh, little vanish meets an old woman named Sibel who gives her the key to an invisible tower and the spell to bring it into sight. The girl protests that she's not a witch. You're a woman, aren't you? The witch replies. The girl lives peacefully, but then the prince comes and disturbs her peace. They seduce each other, but in time the, the prince says he must go. In her anger, Rapunzel pushes him from the tower and he is blinded. 
She then gives a, a birth to a stillborn son. The wise woman puts the dead baby in a crystal casket and tells Rapunzel to go in search of her prince. People are not meant to be alone. Solitude is only for those broken beyond repair. Another quotation. In the end, Rapunzel finds her prince, but he's much changed. I did not truly see until my sight was gone, nor had I listened to my heart, nor the hearts of others until my own had been wounded, the prince says. And as Rapunzel gives this much changed prince the casket, the glass casket, carrying the body of their dead son, the child moves and cries and comes to life. And the final line of the story is, so live the blind king, his wounded wife, and their twice-born son. It's an extraordinary story, very powerful. Actually, there's a bit of a chill just quoting that to you. And finally, James Bradley published last year, the same year actually that um, Bit of Greens came out, um, a, a novella called Beauty Sister. It's uh, told from the point of view of Rapunzel's younger sister, Juniper. She's dark and wild and free, in contrast to the imprisoned golden beauty. As Juniper grows, she becomes obsessed with both the imprisoned girl and the witch who put her there. This is a quote. There was something black inside her, something cold and cunning. Power pleased it, made it stronger. Um, in the end, Juniper betrays both her sister and her sister's lover, who had once been Juniper's lover, and in doing so, she loses them both. Um, it's interesting to, to play around with ideas of why Rapunzel is a story that has inspired so many different um, Australian creative artists. Um, we could we could put forward a theory that it, uh, this tale of imprisonment and escape has a deep resonance in a post-colonial and imaginative landscape in a country whose early role in Western civilization was as a prison, as a tower. One could also say that Rapunzel's struggle to break free of a suffocating mother figure is perhaps a metaphor for mother in England. However, I find that, for me, Rapunzel is a story about personal transformation. The tower, I think, can stand for anything that ties our spirit back, our human spirit back. I think for each of us, in each of these eight creative artists that I've talked about today, I think that the tower has come to mean something different. Um, I think that it, it, it clearly is seen as a struggle between women and about the need for younger women to grow towards some kind of self-determination. Fairy tales speak to us in metaphoric codes, but the power of those metaphoric codes is that their meaning is not fixed. They change, they are transformed with each telling. And this allows the story to give new meaning to each new audience. And that I think is where Arabic's power comes from. In the final pages of The Beauty Sister, James Bradley's heroine, Juniper, says, I have heard many versions of what happened next. Perhaps they are all true. This is what stories do, after all. They go out into the world. They become real. We think we tell them. But they tell us. They make us theirs. And as I say in Bitter Greens, no one can tell a story without transforming it in some way. It is part of the magic of storytelling.